Our goal has always been to help families find media balance, to find high quality content, and to help kids learn how to manage their device use. It's part of our DNA since we were founded 16 years ago, and this is more important now than ever before. I'm so glad we're able to come together for what we're calling our Common Sense Conversations. This is a national digital iteration of our regular local talks, created specifically to address some of your primary, primary concerns during the pandemic. We've tapped our favorite experts to offer real-time advice for navigating the dilemmas you may be experiencing at home right now. I also wanted to share that Common Sense just launched a brand new platform called Wide Open School, designed specifically to address the many issues the quarantine has created for families and teachers. The URL is wideopenschool.org, and our partners include Sesame Street, Nacho, PBS Kids, Scholastic, and Noggin. You can see the full list on the site. It's designed really as a single stop for the resources we all need right now. You can sort by interest, by age, there's a daily schedule. I hope you'll take some time to explore it afterwards. Um, it's really my pleasure today to share that we have Shafia Zaloum, a veteran health educator and author of the newly released book, sex, teens, and everything in between. I, I just have to say this book is so valuable. It's full of real life scenarios and it's just incredibly important for both parents and teens to read. Um, we're really happy to have you all with us today. Before we jump into the webinar, I just wanted to give you a short overview of what to expect. You're on mute because we have hundreds of people on this webinar, but you do have the ability to ask questions to Shafia. If you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A icon. Press that and you'll be able to type in questions. My colleague Melanie in New York will be sharing information back with you. And my other colleagues, Lisa in LA and Aurora in the Bay Area will be monitoring the chat during the discussion. And I'll be sure to sprinkle in your questions throughout our 45 minute session. If you can't stay for the whole 45 minute webinar, don't stress, we'll be posting this video online so you can see it in the future. And we'll also keep you informed about the other hap um, webinars happening. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Shafia and I'm gonna ask you uh, my first question. So thank you again for joining. Um, you're in the process of writing an article right now about how the quarantine is impacting teens differently. Can you share briefly about the different personality types you've identified and, and what you're seeing? Yeah, um, I think that, well, there's a huge variety, just like all of us are experiencing roller coasters of emotions and different living in different contexts with diff access to different resources um, in different situations kids are doing the same. And so kids are having a myriad of experiences just like we are. Um, it's interesting, there are those kids who, you know, kids who identify as being quiet. And so for them, a lot of them feel like, oh, you know, it's kind of a relief not to have to deal with all these, those little um, awkward interactions at school that I face in the hallway or when I show up in a classroom a few minutes early before class starts. Um, and they enjoy being at home. They are comfortable there. Um, some of them have described this to me as like a really, really long um, weekend. Mm -hmm. So for them, you know, they're feeling that way. Um, for other kids who are really social, it's incredibly challenging. Uh, they're trying to stay socially connected. They are in their devices a lot, um, but also trying to maintain a sense of structure. Um, you know, some kids get along with their family really well. Other kids don't so much. I've had kids describe their, themselves and their families as um, really intense people who feel things strongly. And so being so confined in a small space for long periods of time can be really challenging. Um, yet other kids who don't have social media yet. So a lot of it depends on, it. there's several factors. There's age, there's your living situation and context, of course. There's if you have um, one parent, two parents, if you have siblings, um, if your folks are working, how many resources you all have. So that really determines all these different experiences kids are having. What I find a lot of kids talking about is they've realized who their true friends are. So through media, those kids who are FaceTiming their friends and texting on a regular basis have realized that they're inspired to invest in these friendships and keep them going. It's reciprocated. Those are their true friends. And then there's a whole other level of friends who they really appreciate and like, who they see at school and may chat with, but they're not connecting with because 
um, they don't have that depth of friendship. Right. I'm going to go back to talking about those relationships in a moment. Um, another question that's come up a lot is given that developmentally teens are supposed to become, be, you know, increasingly independent apart from their families, how do we foster that healthy independence given shelter in place? Yeah, it's really interesting, um, and my students are talking to me about this. So they're, they're tasked developmentally right now with individuation, which is literally um, exercising more independence, going out and being more social. You know, as they get older and they earn our trust, we allow for more and more of that. That process has been interrupted, and we've We've, we are now requiring them to revert back to a family structure or situation that's more like elementary school, um, certainly, and you know, early middle school. And so that can be hard. So how can we help them? How can we create that at home, that ability to exercise independence? So I think when we make up new rules, when we make up new schedules, because we have to create this new normal, um, we include them in that. So, okay, here's what needs to be done. What are your thoughts on this? How can you contribute to this process and how we figure out how to navigate this space together, how to navigate our schedule now that we all have, you know, different needs and shifting expectations. Um, also too, I think it's appropriate for parents, especially because, you know, kids are home, there's a lot more to do. Um, this can be incredibly stressful. So parents can say to their kids, depending on how old they are and what's appropriate, I only have so much right now in terms of my capacity. What do you have, right? Like how can we work together collaboratively? You know, we're, it's, it's a great opportunity to role model vulnerability, healthy vulnerability, and to ask for help. Um, and then to appreciate that help in our teenagers and to say, wow, that was really helpful. Thank you so much, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that they feel like one, they have an opportunity to contribute in a way that is valued and then appreciated for what they did. I love that. I love that idea that we're a team and we have to do this together and how can we mutually help each other out. Yeah. Going back to what you were saying in terms of um, you're hearing from teens that they know who their real friends are, you know, their true friends in this. If we go a little bit deeper and talk about romantic relationships, mm -hmm. How do we foster healthy romantic relationships during the quarantine? You know, I'm thinking about questions like how much time do we let teens be alone together online? What does it look like in terms of social distancing? I've heard different things from families. Some families say, well, we're sharing germs. And I hear other families saying, oh, no way. That is definitely not happening. We're keeping our kids apart. So what are kind of your thoughts on that? I think it, re it really has to do fundamentally with your family's values. So one, how you're approaching sheltering in place and social distancing and what are things that you're adhering to and what are things you're allowing for. Um, I think that's an important piece. When it comes to how kids are connecting and communicating, it's just different. So kids who are in romantic relationship, I've heard a variety of sort of cares and concerns from them. So on the one hand, they're just, you know, they'll talk about thirst and how they're so horny for their boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it is, you know, that kind of in their language, right? Their desire, their um, need to see them has um, shifted and become more intense. And when I talk to kids, they're like, well, we just, you know, we have to shelter in place. We can't see them like we normally would on a regular basis at school or wherever else. And so that physical piece is missing. Um, so there's that aspect of it online, you know, for me, I think it really depends on their age. So I have a senior, a high school senior, um, and you know, she and her friends really need to be connected. They're experiencing a tremendous sense of loss, um, you know, maintaining perspective because loss is relative right now. And there's so much that's going on and people who are so challenged, um, at the same time, it's real for them, all those expectations, all those rites of passage, which are now disappearing and falling to the wayside. So wanting them to feel like they're socially connected, feeling like they can grieve with their friends and their peers. And a lot of times in romantic relationships, they're the same age and experiencing the same thing. So they can be supportive of each other. Um, in other contexts, some kids are saying, you know, I'm losing my emotional connection with my boyfriend or girlfriend. And I'm worried that it's not gonna be the same when all of this is over. Um, and others yet who have said, 
boy, we've really kind of ramped it up and we were just sort of talking initially, but now I'm wondering, you know, am I going to feel the same way when I see them based on all these built up expectations? Um, so when it comes to how long we let kids stay online, I, I think with all things, we have to create balance, especially with what's happening right now in our homes. And so including your kid and having that conversation and saying, okay, so we want you to feel socially connected. What are your needs? Let's talk about those. And what does that look like in a balanced structured schedule? Not too much structure, definitely have flexibility and role model that, but I would include the kids um, and that's role modeling consent in many ways too, you know, in terms of what are your needs so that they can articulate and identify them. How are you feeling so we can support you and help you um, in how we negotiate how much you're going to be in communication on screens, et cetera. So taking that a, a step further, this is a question from the audience. Um, this parent writes that they're having their child stay at home shelter in place, but their friends are still, their child's friends are still meeting up. Yeah. And so now the parent is feeling like, you know, I'm the mean parent for having my kid be safe. Any advice on how to have a conversation with their teen about that decision? I think it's a combination. It really is, um, you know, both and thinking in terms of, I know this is hard. This is what we're deciding to do. This is what we're committing to as a family when it comes to public health um, and why this is important. And just like all things, even if this wasn't going on, you know, when you, some kids want to go to a party, some kids have no curfew, some kids have a later curfew, some kids have an early curfew. Um, some parents will serve alcohol at their parties, others will not. It really has to do with how you approach public health and safety. Um, and I think it's important that we stick to those values while also exercising some flexibility. So, you know, how can we support our kids in feeling socially connected when it feels like maybe they're missing out or they don't get to do the things other kids get to do? Um, how can we compromise in a way? Um, you know, is it possible? I hear of a variety of situations. So some parents are like, no, there's absolutely no visiting with friends. Other parents who have um, said, okay, you know, these are the friends who I trust you to maintain six feet of distance with. And after two weeks, if you want to go, you know, for your walk today, if you can maintain six feet of distance, you can go for a walk. Um, I know other parents, and this isn't what we're choosing, but who are allowing their kids to see their friends and those in romantic relationships to spend the night with each other. Um, so there really is a diverse representation of how people are interpreting what's going on. Um, and it's such an individual thing, just like in all parenting, you know, you have to hold the line on what you think is really important and what you're doing as a family, but then listen to what your kid has to say and think about ways, you know, how you can get creative and imaginative about ways they can feel more socially connected. Going back to what you were saying too with the different personality types and talking about the quieter kids, um, another parent on the webinar asked, um, said, you know, his or her son is the example of the quieter kid and the parent has been really encouraging him to FaceTime with friends, connect with friends, and um, her son, his or her son has shown no interest. So mm. any advice on how to kind of promote still those social interactions? You know, it's interesting what I've discovered, particularly for boys and more with girls now too, because of the sheltering in place, um, like game, you know, gaming rooms, party rooms that kids go into and can play video games and things like that together. I have a couple of students who are quiet who have said, you know, sports and um, video games have been helpful because they're quiet. They wouldn't necessarily uh, make an effort to socially connect in such an intimate and intense way, like FaceTiming. But if they were in a space with other kids doing something that that felt more um, comfortable. So there's that aspect of things. Um, you know, and then there's family, something that I think is important. And for quiet kids, maybe this isn't the way by which they feel comfortable connecting with others. And it is hard to feel like you need to be doing that when you're already um, probably, you know, online a whole lot for school. But with families, I think you can also create um, 
social interaction, which is ultimately what's the most important thing. So, you know, organize amongst your family. We did that in my house, you know, people in New Jersey, people in California, we all zoomed together on Friday at five o'clock. Um, and, and my kids were included. Um, and I think that that's actually a really good way too to encourage staying connected socially with others. So maybe it's not so much with friends, um, but with family. And then also too, you know, they are getting social interaction with school. And then just to reinforce those other aspects of how can they collectively connect in a digital space that's safe. That's great. So hitting on that really key component of just having some type of social interaction, even if it isn't with friends directly, but with family, thinking about some of the other critical pieces for adolescent development. Um, I'm thinking about sleep and about exercise. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit and how you think about that in terms of quarantine? I think it's so important. Um, and I think that and we've seen this in tons of articles that have been written how important it is to have some semblance of a schedule. So encourage your, your kids to get up, to take a shower, to get dressed, to maintain those routines that we normally do to, you know, that typical sort of cadence of life that you're involved in. And then, and the other part of it is to still have parameters and guidelines. So again, invite your kid and to say, look, as a responsible adult, this is what's going on. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty here. And so we want to be flexible, but for right now, we need to figure out a way to create a sense of balance while still allowing for you to be socially connected. That's important to us too. Um, let's come up with, you know, a way to do that. And then I think, you know, in terms of the sleep, we actually, um, what, what I've seen and some students have talked about in my own children is this compulsion that you're in the digital space more, so you're drawn to it more, um, wanting to stay connected, FOMO, you know, those different things. And so at a certain hour, we just say, and this is consistent with what we usually do, everything gets turned in or we shut down the Wi-Fi at 10 p.m. Um, and kids can watch TV, they can hang out together, they can do all kinds of things. I mean, I, they happen, mine happen to have siblings. Um, but then they go to sleep on their own, um, which I think is important. Exercise, super important, also helps to manage stress and anxiety and will keep them on a sleeping schedule. I hear a lot of students reporting that um, their sleep has been disrupted and kids who are taking naps at weird times of day or um, you know, staying up all night and going to bed really, really late and then sleeping really late and sort of having erratic patterns, um, which is fine once in a while, you know, if your kid goes on spring break or it's the weekend or something, but I still think some semblance of a schedule, making sure your kid gets outside um, in a way that's appropriate for the shelter, sheltering in place in your um, area, but that movement happens. Um, and sometimes it takes asking too, what's it going to take? What will it take? What, what sounds appealing to you? Do you want to go for a walk? Do you have a pet that needs to go for a walk, you know, a dog or something like that? Um, getting out, out and doing different things. There are also classes online, um, different schools are doing things like fitness challenges and stuff like that, sort of finding out what's there so that you can um, bring that into the conversation as you hold your kid um, accountable to their overall well-being and taking care of themselves. And that means getting outside. I want to shift to some of the themes that came up in your book. And one of those was about um, how teens are communicating over tech. So even before the pandemic, and especially now, question, is, is conversation over the phone or via text, is that a good trend for teenage romance because kids are able to have a real emotional connection before a physical one? This is a toughie. Um, and I would say it depends. It depends on the context. Context is everything when it comes to relationships. And um, I, th I really think it's important to process that with our kids so that they understand that. And a great way to communicate about context is with tickling, for instance. So I'll say to kids, so imagine you're at home and you're in a tickle war. Um, with your parenting adult or a sibling or whomever, there's probably joy, there's laughter. If it's annoying you, you could pretty easily say, you know, stop, please cut it out. Um, then imagine yourself on the street and some random person tickling you. 
And I'll ask kids, what would that feel like? And after this sort of, you know, big dramatic, oh, you know, kind of laughter and oh no's and kind of thing that say, well, violated, confused, defensive, scared. And I'll say, okay, so same thing tickling, completely different context. So there's a variety of context shifts that are happening right now. Um, in the context of the digital space, I think it's really important that kids understand you can't build a relationship through a device, but you can maintain one. So it really depends on what was established prior in those kids' relationships before they started texting so much through a device. Um, you know, and it's interesting because the algorithm for hooking up, like, because that, it sounds to me that question is coming out of, which is a very real thing, a lot of times kids now believe that you get physical first to see if it will turn into something emotional. Um, and that that actually, you know, I find kids do better and are more successful in their relationships. As most of us know, if you first, you know, connect, have an authentic connection, create a sense of intimacy, um, and then deepen that with physical exploration um, and sexual exploration. And so, you know, I actually think that, um, and I've heard some kids say, what if I don't feel the same way when I physically see them? And I've had kids report prior to the pandemic, we were talking so much, but only through our devices. And then they had this false sense of knowing somebody. And then they went to, you know, be sexually active with them. And they were like, this is not the person I thought they were. This does not feel like the person, the, the, the embodied experience of this is not the same thing that I experience when I'm texting with them. Um, and I think, you know, kids um, may not have enough experiential context to really understand how much a vibe and being um, with someone and connecting with someone um, authentically plays into, how much that plays into intimacy. Um, and so when the context shifts and changes, they have to realize that um, how they feel like they know someone may also. So then is this a good trend? Because it feels like something that parents would want their kids to learn. How to communicate through a digital device? Well, well learning that it only takes you so far. You know, I think so. I, I think that if you look at it from that perspective, that yes, that it will highlight for them, you know, oh, wow, I really thought I knew somebody, but then now I'm with them physically, and I don't. Um, I worry about gender socialization, which can be really influential in certain aspects where kids feel like they build up expectations sexually through text exchange, and then they get to a situation where there's this expectation that they'll then become sexually active with that person, and they feel like because they had that text exchange, even though it doesn't feel right, that they may feel obligated to go ahead with it. And that's where I start to um, get concerned, because I've heard about that happening prior to a pandemic. Um, and I know that kids are thinking about it too. Kids too who, um, kids too who will say, you know, I, um, I was feeling bold because everybody's in this pandemic, there's all this activity going on where people are sort of flirting with each other, connecting with each other, Snapchatting each other in flirty ways that are kind of sexual. Um, but then what happens when they have these expectations or what if I don't feel that way when I'm there, do I have to, you know, am I obligated to then do what I said I would or to explore, um, become sexually active with them? And the answer is no, but I don't know that kids necessarily have the confidence and wherewithal to be able to articulate that and, and do that. So you've been talking about kind of the flirting um, on Snapchat and so forth. Any advice on how to talk to kids about sexting, the risks of sexting? I can imagine that it's probably happening even more now. Oh, yes. Well, you know what's interesting? And we can look at what's happening with adults because out of the Kinsey Institute um, at University of Indiana, there is some research going on right now on how the pandemic is impacting sex lives of adults um, and sexting, which is really interesting. And Twitter has reported that sexting is on the rise and using certain emojis that are sexually suggestive. Um, and in, I had an email exchange with um, 
a researcher in particular there. And there is a case to say that for those kids who are already comfortable online engaging in sort of flirting and sexual banter in the digital space, are probably there's an uptick in doing more of that. And then for those kids who aren't, they're, they're fine to saying, okay, you know what, I'm just gonna wait this out. This is not for me. Like, I'm not gonna go there and turn their attention to other things. Um, and that's happening in the adult space too. So those who tend to be already um, expressive and active in terms of their sexuality and what that looks like in the digital space and doing it through the digital space, um, we're seeing an uptick, but for those who aren't, we're actually seeing a downward trend. And there's a downward trend overall. So it's interesting, when I ask all my classes, how many of you, you know, via Zoom, how many of you think sexting is on the rise? All of them raise their hands. But then when I start talking to them about it, they're like, well, it really depends on who you are and how you identify um, in your personality and if you are already sexting or not. Interesting. So it's exacerbating or kind of magnifying behaviors yeah. that were there beforehand, but yeah. not really creating new habits. Right. So I would say, you know, in parenting your kids around sexting, you could even say, because it's being reported on, I've heard that this is happening. It's on the rise amongst adults. Do you think that's happening with kids too? Um, or how has this changed how young people are connecting and communicating? Um, how do you think people who are in relationships are staying connected and having, you know, having a relationship with each other when they can't be together? And those are questions you can ask. I mean, it's important for kids to know the legal responsibilities they have when it comes to this. Um, not only is it illegal and against federal law because it's considered trafficking in child pornography, although some states have texting, you know, teen sexting laws. Um, it's important for kids to understand that. It's really important for kids to understand that if it's unwelcome or not asked for, that it can be sexual harassment to sex someone. Um, and then there's a privacy issue, no matter you know, what aspect of it, it there is. So in terms of the terms and conditions in like Snapchat or Instagram, many kids haven't read that. They don't know necessarily that um, even though it disappears in their phone, doesn't mean it wasn't screenshot, it wasn't forwarded, that it didn't go up into Snapchat's cloud. Um, you know, all those sort of things that kids need to know that um, what they post is not ever really, it's essentially public. And then they have to think in terms of, well, would you want a, a future employer to see this? Would you want a future college admissions person to see this? Um, you know, so much of what's going on now is this moment, the context feels really different. There's a false sense of security when you're sitting in your home, but encouraging kids to remember that the digital space is really an extension of their personal space. Um, and as they curate who they are online, to be really mindful um, of those things. And our kids also need refusal skills. Um, if someone solicit, you know, if someone is sexting you or someone is sending you nudes or asking for nudes, like how do you refuse? Um, you know, I think we would all hope our kids have the confidence to say, you know, stop sending me these or block somebody or look me, a picture of me naked in the dark, you know, whatever it is. But it's not as easy as you think to say no because of the social implications um, that this could have because kids are not just saying no to the sex or the nude, they're saying no to the person who's asking or the person who's offering. And that person's social currency in the social landscape that they navigate. And if they're feeling particularly insecure about their connections or their friendships or whatever because of all the sheltering in place, they may be more vulnerable to asks um, or not necessarily feeling as confident. So, you know, talking through with your kid critical thinking skills around, okay, so how could I refuse but still save face, right? Like, oh, my Wi-Fi went out or five people at home on Wi-Fi with distance learning couldn't, couldn't do it or let's save it for after all of this is over. You know, um, helping kids to, to find, you know, different, not just this proverbial hammer of just say no, but in addition to that, although it's important, um, other nuanced ways to not participate um, in the sexting piece. I think it's so helpful having those concrete suggestions of how to refuse and talk about it. 
you know, thinking about how we're spending more time together and it's also an opportunity to be using media more together. Any media you'd recommend that you really like for helping to spark some of these conversations or giving those kind of real life examples? I do. So for elementary and middle school age people um, in your homes, I really like amaze.org videos. I think that they're really fantastic and they have parent scripts and parent pieces and then they have videos you can show your kids and then ways you can talk about them. Um, I think Amaze does a wonderful job um, with what they represent. If you have older kids, so teenagers, older teenagers, high school kids, Planned Parenthood has some really good educational videos um, on you know, how to engage in sexual communication around sexually transmitted infections, um, also around consent. I've, you know, older kids can find those consent videos somewhat um, cringy so uncomfortable and awkward, which of course is real. Sex, talking about sex a lot of the time is uncomfortable and awkward. Um, and sometimes the most difficult conversations are the most important ones to have. So we can communicate that message and role model that too. Um, I find being more emergent in the approach is also really important for middle and high school kids. You can do this with elementary school kids too because you know, consent is really fundamentally about how we educate others on how to treat us and how to listen for how others want to be treated. So you can talk about the values of respect and care and um, all those different things at different, you know, developmental stages. For middle and high school kids, I would find out what they're watching. What's interesting? What, you know, it's a pandemic. What's everybody streaming? What's going on? And either you can either watch with them or not. It depends. Um, on what you're going to take on and how comfortable they are or aren't. Get to know the characters and talk to them. It, you know, talking about media is fantastic. And I know Common Sense Media has a lot of like dinner, you know, sort of suggested questions that you can ask about certain shows and things like that. Um, but make it really values based, you know. Do you think both, you know, do you think that was about infatuation or they were really connected and, and cared about each other? Um, did both people get to walk away with their dignity? Um, did it seem like they were respecting each other or did you hear any coercion? Your kid would be like, well, what's that? Uh, persuasive language to get them to do what they wanted them to do. That seemed like it was a bit manipulative. So, but not, not overwhelming them with questions, but just asking one here and there, talking up to your kid, allowing them to be the expert in the media they're watching and what's going on in it. And then inserting your own observations and values don't start with why. Why connotes judgment and kids need an environment free of judgment, shame, and ultimatums to share with open honesty. Um, and they'll get really suspicious really quick. Um, although they might if you use how and what, you know, too, but lead with the how and the what. Like what would it, what do you think it would take for them to actually really connect? Um, what do you think it would take that character to show up for that person in, a, in, a, in the way they want them to? Um, how did you know that it was more about infatuation than authentic connection? Um, how do you think that, how do you think they, they treated each other with dignity? What was explicit, what was it that you saw? Um, I think those are really important questions to be asking. And if you want to go drill down right into consent, you know, did you think that was consensual? I can't, I can't I'm having a hard time because I was confused. There was one moment when it was, but then there was another when it wasn't. And so I'm trying to guess, you know, and then let them pop in to, you know, and, and contribute to say, well, this is what I thought, or, you know, this is what I saw. Um, and then listen more and talk less uh, after you ask those questions. It's so great. I love how meaty those questions are. Um, a, a question from one of the audience members is, how do you kind of take those types of questions to asking them just what they're doing online? You know, what kinds of conversations are happening over Snapchat? Again, without feeling too invasive. Sure. Um, so do you mean shifting media, like your conversations about what you're talking about in the media to what they're actually doing? So there's that piece. And then also just in general, you know, our kids are on their devices yeah. right now. And prior to the pandemic, a lot of us wanted to know, how do I ask my kid what they're doing or what they're talking about? So here's the thing is that a lot of the time when it comes to digital devices and whatever it is that we're managing our kids. 
you're on it too much, or maybe you should do something more productive or get off and focus on your homework or whatever it is. And I think to have credibility to, with kids and for them to open up and share with us what their digital world looks like, sounds like, feels like, that we have to take the time with humility and mutual respect to discover what the awesomeness is. And that's going to be different for every kid. Um, and you know, and so a lot of the time I'll just say, so help me understand, like, what's so awesome about Snapchat and how is it helping people stay connected through this pandemic? You know, is it with your good friends? Is it with, this is where you allow them to become the expert, right? And that you are student, you are learning. Um, and, you know, I had my son um, who's 16, this was a year or two ago, and I just said, okay, so I want to understand, like, what is it that you love so much about X, Y, and Z video game? Um, and he said, well, it was this, he just launched, like, I have a, I have two very social and then one quiet kid, and he just launched and started talking. It was telling me about characters and skins and all kinds of different things, and I said, wait a minute, okay, I don't, this is a language I don't speak, would you show me? And he was like, yeah, you want to, you want to watch me play? I was like, uh, yeah, okay, great. So, and I watched him play um, and he said, do you want to try? And I tried it. And I think that's a really important um, thing to do. I know that also, for instance, in the New York Times this last weekend, there was a whole list of video games that are appropriate for families at different ages. And I imagine Common Sense recommends that too, right? So find those games you could play together, ask your kid about the games in which they're playing, um, help, you know, ask, and then once you sort of do that kind of a thing, um, and if your kid isn't playing video games to say, how are kids using social platforms to, to connect with each other? Like, is it helpful? Is it helpful during the pandemic to feel more socially connected? Um, how has that worked for your friends? Is it working for you? Is there a way we should be more supportive so you can feel more socially connected? Are there some things I should be concerned about? Um, what's your, you know, sort of ask your kid to take a sociological perspective on things um, in, and allowing them to be the expert. So what are you seeing? And do you think that's a good thing? Do you think things will be different when we all get through this? You know, that kind of, of, a, of an approach. I really appreciate you modeling that genuine curiosity. Um, so I'm gonna, I have one final question from the audience before I kind of ask you some wrapping up questions. Yeah. But, um, you know, as kids are spending a lot of time online, they may be stumbling upon porn. Oh, yes. For those who are stumbling and those who are intentionally looking for it, what's your advice around navigating porn? So porn tends to be, and porn watching is organized by gender in many ways. Um, and I find that, you know, kids, the, the porn they're watching is not the, there's the real porn, the feminist porn, you know, empowered porn, the porn that's sort of behind a paywall and you have to be 18 and there's a lot of access that you have to, sort of walls of, that you need to go through to get to access it. It really is the stuff from Pornhub, the free um, internet porn. And I think what's really important, it's interesting in asking my students about pornography, um, and some boys in particular talking about how um, masturbation and, you know, using porn to masturbate is definitely up because there's nothing else to do is literally what they say. Um, and that porn assists in that. Um, and then other, you know, younger kids who may come across it or it's being shared, um, whatever it may be. It's really important that kids understand that pornography is not representative of most people's safe sexuality practices and healthy relationships. Um, that learning about sex from watching porn is like watching the Fast and the Furious to learn how to drive. Um, and that it's really important kids understand too, given what their brains are doing, how they're you know, being remodeled and under construction, um, in addition to myelination and neurological pruning and these parts of the brain that have to do with our sexual identity formation, that those things are being shaped by what we expose ourselves to, how we engage in media, specifically representations of sexuality. Um, and so, you know, talking to our kids, it's first and foremost, it's so important not to, to have this conversation without judgment and shame. 
to acknowledge and to say to kids, you know, it's really normal and natural to be curious about sex. It's really normal and natural to be curious about porn, to be drawn to porn, to be aroused by porn. But let's talk about what porn actually is and what it represents, that it's for entertainment um, and that there's nothing really private about it and for making money. Um, and that 70, you know, 73, I want to make sure I get my percentages right, but 73% of, you know, internet porn is actually misogynist, veiled, and exaggerated response. And what does that mean exactly? Um, there's virtually no relationship context. So I think it's important that, you know, we have these, this is not one gigantic talk. These are, you know, collecting moments, smaller conversations um, across time. And just acknowledging what, that porn is out there, that it is accessible, asking our kids again, do you think there's an uptick in how much porn people are watching? People are online a whole lot more um, and are bound to come across it. I think it's important to just, um, you know, more than anything, say that I'm here for you to talk about this. Um, it really is not representative of most people's healthy sexual practices. Um, and so I want to make sure that if you're curious about sex, you get the right information from credible resources. Um, and, you know, all the way to the kids who are masturbating to pornography, you know, there are concerns about what that will do to their capacity to connect with and have a healthy sexual relationship, intimate relationship with, with a person. Um, and to talk about how it's actually healthier to masturbate in a variety of contexts, in privacy, of course, but not just solely to pornography. Um, and that there are other representations of sexuality that are really important. What I like to hit home and I think is really important for parents to remember and understand is that porn does not engage our children's imagination. So older kids, of course, I'm talking about. Now, younger kids, there are some things kids just can't see. And now that we have to bring down a lot of walls and filters because we're all working from home, or we have older kids with younger siblings who need to research and do things for school, that kind of thing, it's really important that we be vigilant about this because there really are some things kids can't unsee. Um, and so younger kids, you know, being on top of what they're watching, how they're cruising, you know, the internet and things like that, if they are at all. Um, with older kids, when it comes to pornography and having open conversations about it, um, what I just said, but then also to remind kids that this is not, it's, it's, you know, it's developmentally appropriate in the teen years to explore their sexuality, not only with themselves, but others, as long as it's consensual, they have an individual sense of readiness, they're pacing themselves, and it's safe, emotionally and physically safe. Um, and so, you know, one aspect of that is imagination and engaging the imagination. Pornography is, when we were younger, even if it was a still image, it was hard to come by, so it wasn't as accessible. If it was a still image, um, you still had to engage your imagination. The online porn now is someone else's imagination, and it's a very representation of someone else's fantasy. Um, and can be quite exploitive in that way. And it's oral, so you hear it. You're through, it's coming through a digital device, so there's a dopamine reward response that comes with it. Um, and then if kids are masturbating to it, there's that added element too. So just talking through with your kid, you know, giving them important information about the potential impact and effects of porn that you want them to learn about sexuality in healthy ways, that it's really about balancing responsibility and pleasure and how do they know when they're ready for certain things or not. Um, there's also a chapter in my book that really breaks down all the different aspects of porn and different things you could pick up on to talk about and gives you the language to do that. There were so many pearls in that, Shafia. Thank you. I'm just thinking about the fast and the furious, thinking about even the, the element of um, manipulation in terms of you're seeing someone else's fantasy and we know no one likes to be manipulated. So we are, audience members, we are going a little bit over time because this conversation has been so rich. So to wrap us up, Shafia, I'd love for you to leave us with, you know, one or two top takeaways. I know there was, there was so much. <laughs> um, you know, I think... I think the most important thing is um, 
And I think what kids would appreciate is that we not make assumptions about what we're doing, but actually ask them with genuine curiosity what it's like for them to be, if they're feeling socially connected, connected and how they're doing that, um, not only in their, in, their space at home, but through the digital space, making sure they don't have any questions that you can be the askable parent, um, identifying certain things that you've read about or you've learned about because you saw this, you know, this convert, you heard this conversation on this common sense media um, piece today. And I'm curious to know, is that what you're seeing? Is that what you're thinking? Just be curious and supportive of your kids. Lead with empathy um, and, you know, treat, treating each other with dignity, which is ultimately what we're hoping to model and that they will put into practice in their relationships. Well, thank you so much, Shafia. Um, I hope everyone will join me in a virtual round of applause. And please check out Shafia's book, sex teens and everything in between. It's filled with so much useful information, these great tips and strategies. And it's, you have an ebook version available too, right? Yes, absolutely. There's audio, there's ebook version. Yeah. I really encourage everyone to get it. Um, I'd also love for everyone to check out wideopenschool.org and share it with your communities. Um, and I also wanted to say a huge thanks to all of you who've donated to help support what Common Sense does for free. For those of you who haven't yet, we'd love for you to consider supporting us. And we also hope that you'll join us next week. Next Wednesday, we'll be talking with Ellen Galinsky. Um, thank you all for joining us. And Shafia, thank you again so much. Really appreciate you. Thanks for having me.